Well, back in the day now with uh, a bit of a legend here, Paul. Paul Parker, former England player and QPR and Manchester United. I want to ask you, Paul, straight away, what was it like when you got the call to go and play for Manchester United? Well, it was one of shock, to be perfectly honest. I was actually sitting there with the, um, the late Terry Venables <clears throat> in a hotel in London on the verge of signing for Tottenham. Yep. And I was just sitting there that afternoon and um, the then um, solicitor of Manchester United, Morris Watkins, made a phone call to my agent and and that they asked me to come up on that Saturday. Terry Venables actually said, to be fair to him, um, you've got to go. You've got to talk to a club, you can't be rude. You've got to go and speak to them. Well, and I kind of went, right. I kind of looked a little bit because I thought I was going to stay in London. And I felt really, you know, I felt guilty. He said, but one thing now, and I kind of went, oh, what's that? He goes, I bet you don't come back. And he was absolutely correct. <laughs> I didn't. So what sort of sales pitch, if you like, did Sir Alex give you to go there? He walked me around the ground and just telling me all different bits around the ground, who's, you know, telling me the kind of famous people who's in what seats they sat in, um, how much each stand's held. Yeah. Um, I asked a question, why there's so many cars parked out front? Is, was there a game on or something? He goes, no, people just visit in the ground. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I said. And he said, well, we've got a museum. I kind of went, a museum? And I just didn't, I couldn't believe that yeah. a museum. And, he's, and then all of a sudden a pile of people just come into the stand, the now Sir Alex Ferguson stand, and they all sat down and there's someone at the front who was just talking to them. And it was just amazing to see that, you know, coming from Fulham and NQPR and just seeing that amount of people just coming to look around yeah, the yeah. ground. And, it was just something I'd never witnessed before in my life. But Tottenham Oxford at that time, that, I suppose, is that when Glenn Hoddle was playing for Tottenham? Um, no, this was um, 91, this was. So it? Um, it was Terry, yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah, Terry Venables. And... But this was a good side, Tottenham, uh, at that time, yeah. wasn't it? Was, was Gazza playing at that time? Yes, Gazza would have been there, yeah. Wouldn't you fancy played with him at club level? I would have said, without a doubt, after you know spending those weeks, good, bad or indifferent with him during a World Cup. <laughs> But to play with Gascoigne could have added, you know, given you know a little bit more kudos yeah. to me as a player. But the opportunity to go and play for Manchester, just arriving there, seeing the size of the stadium, the amount of people who were just there walking around, mm. it's it's just one of those opportunities that you couldn't say no to. I mean, you'd have been back in the day, Paul. You've been on a decent wage, obviously, playing yeah. for these football teams. But you see some of the wages that the the young players are earning yeah. these days. Basically, at 18 now, they can sign a contract to make them a millionaire. Mm. and they'll be secure for the rest of their life. Do they, they lose a bit then, some, some of the young players? I think human nature says that you lose a bit of your yeah. edge. There isn't many who can actually get through it and carry on pre that. It's, it's almost impossible to do that because you get that little, you get that comfort zone. So it is wrong in a way for them to be given that amount of money, but to get them, but they should give it in a different way. Yeah. It's, it's about keeping them hungry because that's what keeps keeps you in football, keeps you surviving. Is there surviving. enough protection for young people, like mentors and buddies, when you know, when these young people sign on? Because it's, I mean, for an 18 year old to be on this sort of money, mm. it's like, it's mind blowing. I would have thought that, you know, the club should wrap their arms around them a little bit. Have a, I know Fergie was quite strict in the day, weren't he, with his young players? Mm. And, but I don't see so much of that these days. Paul. Well, we don't hear so much of it. Sir Alex done it and people talked about it because of those young players who were there in the um in the, in the foresight of everybody, but I look at it and today and the best people who can be in that position to look after these young players yeah. are their parents or their close friends. Clubs couldn't offer, yeah. but are you going to listen to a stranger or are you going to listen to someone close to you who's actually telling you that maybe the home truths about life unless you know if you don't do it the right way. Now you've played in some big games, <clears throat> massive games, semi-final World Cup 1990, won quite a few trophies with Man United. Could you sleep before a big game? No, never. Never? Never even. We have sometimes go to ho go away, you know, stay overnight and then wake up in the morning, go for walks, and then you've got a whole day waiting for a game. Yeah. I think you try and sleep and you're... Sometimes I think I played the game. Yeah. That not, you know, what we was playing later on, it was in my head. Of, it's almost... Some people will say they did, but the ones who, the ones who actually did it, it's very, very minimal. I think yeah. it's impossible. So sleep. then you've, you've, you've had a sleepless night, you've gone and won a big match, won a trophy, a, a Premier League or mm. a, a FA Cup or something like that. And then how long does that buzz last after? I said, probably don't sleep the following night. 
Oh, I think you do. The more yeah. so the other when you haven't got that in front of you, especially when you've been successful as well. You, you know, you get it out of the way. Let's put it this way. It's always difficult to lose a big game yeah. for Manchester United. And then it's difficult to sleep that night knowing that, you know, there's people around that that game meant so much to, say, losing a Manchester oh, derby yeah. Oh, yeah. or losing to Liverpool, which yeah. is... <laughs> Which is always going to be hard if you, if you're a Manchester United fan. I, I'm glad you said that because we always hear about the famous hairdryer treatment. Mm. Did you ever get that from from Fergie? Oh, I got a few. I've got a few from him. Yeah, yeah. With, without a doubt. There isn't many who got away with it. I can only name one during my time who always got away with it, and that would be Eric. Yeah. Eric always got away with it. Yeah. But um, I think we'd have to say, given what Eric done in that time, I think as players, one of the players who played with him would accept that. He cut him a bit of slack as well, didn't he? Especially during the, the Kung Fu kick era as well. Um, mm. I think most players would have been out, out the door, wouldn't they, for that? Yeah, I think I think it was a little bit more slacker than slack, to be honest. <laughs> you know, he knew it, he, the boss knew it was wrong. The yeah. boss tried to tell him after the game, but the manner in which the boss actually told him made a lot of us laugh. Yeah. But um, <laughs> What did he say to him? He just virtually just, after telling everyone else what they'd done wrong, yeah. ripping into him seriously ripping into him. He just virtually said to Eric, you can't do that, son. And I thought he might have been a little bit more heavy than that, but we all just looked at each other and <laughs> we just all started laughing. Yeah, so and then it, then it went more serious about it after, but his talent, <clears throat> you couldn't let talent like that go. If it's not, there's a chance to keep it, you keep it. And the boss was proved right in keeping it. He was proved right. I suppose there's a bit of a trade-off there, isn't there? His, his yeah. behaviour or whatever, some of the antics he got up to against, he was a brilliant footballer. Yeah, but it's what he done after Eric as well that made sure, I'm sure, made the boss feel even better. You know, what he'd done with, he had to do community service and yeah. there was kids were coming into the cliff training ground mm. and it was easy for Eric just to stand around and let other people do the coaching. Yeah. But he didn't, he joined in and he made a point of speaking to every single kid over a, a, a fair number of weeks. So we've got the we've got the Euros next year and then mm. in, in a couple of years after that we've got the World Cup. I think, Paul, that the, the current batch, no disrespect to your generation, of, of young England players are absolutely brilliant. Mm. I think they're probably the best batch of talented players we've had uh, in, in a long time. Are we going to win something, finally? Well, I mean, you said it there. We have got a, a decent set of um, young players. We've got a decent set of players. We've got a manager who's been to a semi-final and a mm. final, so he'll be our most experienced manager going into another tournament. But what we've got as well is we have to remember is that the Euros um, is not a strong tournament anymore. Yeah. I always used to say that the Euros was the most difficult to win because <clears throat> all the, the best sides in the world, the majority come from Europe. Yeah. Now Europe is quite poor, to be honest. That's why we get poor qualifying now. The qualifiers are awful. To, for the Euros now, yeah. they're, they're not worth being in. Really. So I want you to pick two players out now, Paul. Uh, one from domestic football and one from international football. The two mm. best players you've ever played against and why? Played against? Yeah. Um, if I was going to go at club level, I mean, there's so many players I've played against, but I've always got to mention Paul Gascoigne in one, you know, yeah. in, I have to mention him, just what a talent he was. And it's just a shame that he never... He couldn't keep it going, yeah. and, you know. But then you look at George Best, someone like yeah. that, you know. Those kind of players, they don't seem to be around for 10, 15, 20 years. Do mm. that at that level, they yeah. seem to just peak, and that's it. And yeah. Paul's one of them, definitely. On the um, on the international side, I, on Europe and everything, I have to say one of them, which is an, another great player, but injuries curtailed his career was Paolo, Paolo Futre, okay. the Portuguese yeah. player. Played against him at Atletico Madrid. Um, he did come to England, he came to West Ham, but his, his knees were shot by yeah. then. But he was a wonderful player. But their players, you know, he was a player that not many people would know about, but he was a seriously good player. Well, you had a brilliant career, Paul. Um, I think most young men watching this would give the right arm to, to do what you've done. I know. That's if I can remember. You know what, I'm one of those people, of course they can remember you. I mean, <laughs> I'm one of those people that um, still has dreams about scoring a winning goal in the cup final. Uh, and then you wake up and you realise that you're 50-odd and you've got no chance. But 